Hi friends, here's my recap of Saturday morning part one session of the powerful by faith Jehovah's Witness online convention. As usual, I broke the video down to its bare bones. I think it was about an hour and 20 minutes long and I sped it up by a quarter of a percent because they just speak so slow. So the video, the this session starts with a 10 minute video of witnesses um, preaching all around the world with a beautiful song sung in many different languages, but I cut it out because I'm going to try to recap this in 30 minutes or less. We'll see if we can get this one done because this one is just jam packed, okay? So anyway, let's get started, take a look. The scripture theme for today's program is taken from Jude verse three, where we are told to put up a hard fight for the faith. We'll see how we can demonstrate our faith regardless of our circumstances. And we'll see how we can help others to build faith. Okay, friends, so why was this verse written and preserved in Scripture? The very next verse of Jude 4 tells us the reason. It says, For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I wanted to thank one of my viewers who sent me this picture of the open air church in Belgium for, that I will be using for my slides today. Thanks so much, my friend. So contend for the face because evil men will creep in unaware denying grace. What does this mean? Friends, listen, those of us who have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ are saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. I say this all the time, but evil men say that one must work out their salvation. Hmm. Why does Watchtower choose so many verses that have to do with false prophets? They're telling you who they truly are, friends. If you just look for it, you can see it. You're going to see a lot in this video, all right? So let's see what these guys have to say um, during this annual convention. And Ronald Curzan will begin with a talk about Jonah. Now, what he, a lot of what he has to say about Jonah is true that the Ninevites were evil and that Jonah went and preached to them and that they repented of their evil and that God saved them. But listen, this is very sinister what he's about to do because he's going to twist things to put fear into the minds of modern day Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? I just wanna give you a brief recap of the book of Jonah because it's an amazing book, but Watchtower just wants you to focus on the fact that Jonah was afraid, you'll see it. But Jonah was not afraid of the Ninevites, okay? Jonah pictured the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jonah booked passage on a ship to get away from God. God sent a great storm to try to get the, the attention of all of those on board. It threatened all of their lives and the seamen couldn't do anything. They tried to row very, very hard. They couldn't do anything to save themselves. When they asked Jonah how to be saved from the storm, Jonah said in verse one, uh, chapter one, verse 12, take me up and cast me forth into the sea, so shall the sea be calm unto you. Listen, Jonah was cast by the seamen who were unbelievers. They were faithful to the Lord when Jonah wasn't being faithful, okay? So they cast Jonah into the sea and Jonah died. Jonah had to die for those on the earth to be saved, okay? Jonah gave up his life, Jesus gave up his life. Jonah was resurrected and his soul was brought up and Jesus was resurrected and his soul was brought up from being in the heart of the earth. Jonah was then seen and preached to the Ninevites and Jesus was then seen and he preached on the earth as well. Listen friends, the Bible tells us that Jonah was a sign, and I'm, I'm gonna put some of these verses on the screen for you, but Jonah was a sign and Jesus was a sign. Listen, Jesus said, behold, the wounds in my hands. Listen, Jonah, that fish tried to consume Jonah for three days. He must not have had any hair on his body, no eyelashes, no eyebrows, his skin must have been bleached. And then he went and preached to the Ninevites and the Ninevites, what did they do? They believed. There was nothing they could do to save themselves. They believed and God repented of the evil. He changed his mind and he did not destroy them. Look at the top in bold. Jonah paid the fare thereof, whereas 1 Corinthians 6.20, Jesus had 
paid the price for mankind. Verse 13, nevertheless, the men in the ship, they rode hard to bring it to land, but they could not. No amount of work could save them. In Matthew 12, the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign. Jesus said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Notice Jonah 2 verse 5, he said, the weeds were wrapped about, around my head. And in John 19, Jesus had a crown of thorns on his head. The primary theme of Jonah is that God's mercy and compassion is boundless. That's what it's about, but that's not what Watchtower wants you to believe. I didn't even give the book of Jonah justice. I'm just trying to give you a very brief overview, but I want you to see what Watchtower now has to say about Jonah. They show this dramatization of Jonah going into the city afraid of the people because they're mean and they're evil. But then once they turn to what Watchtower says is Jehovah, the God of Watchtower, then they become nice. This is not the case at all, friends. But just take a look at Watchtower's rendition of Jonah. First, let's consider the example of the Ninevites. As you recall, they are Assyrians, or were Assyrians, who lived in the capital city of Nineveh, and it was founded by Nimrod. It was referred to as the city of bloodshed. With that history and backdrop, we can imagine what the people were like. Yes, they were aggressive, they were violent people, and they took pleasure in sadistically torturing their captives. Well, their reputation was known by all the surrounding nations including God's people. So that's why Jehovah sent his prophet Jonah to go there and proclaim their destruction. Gave you this assignment instead of Jonah, how might you have reacted? Would you have thought about the Ninevites and their cruelty and their wickedness and say, they can change? Or would you feel it's impossible? It'll never happen. Not in a million years. Well, how did Jonah view his assignment? He was afraid of the Ninevites, maybe what they thought of him or what they would do once they heard his message. And Jonah had to look at himself and relook at his assignment. He was not the judge. He was not the jury. He was a messenger. We are ministers who have a message. We're not the judges. In the following video, notice the changes that the Ninevites made and how they benefited. Are you Jonah? I am. Thank you. Well, Jehovah is the judge. And how did he judge the Ninevites worthy of being saved? Like the Ninevites, many today are taught wrong beliefs and attitudes from childhood. And it may be difficult to change, but not impossible. Hebrews 4.12 says the Word of God can help. The Word of God is alive and exerts power. Many of us are living proof of the Bible's power to change us. Listen, friends, it's the judgment seat of Christ. Christ is the judge. Nowhere in scripture does it say that the Jehovah, the God of Watchtower, will do the judging. Every knee will bow before their judge, Jesus Christ. And those who have put their faith and trust in him will bow before him as their savior. Those who don't will bow before them, before him as their judge. All right, Mark Sanderson is next. Do you have relatives that are presently not serving Jehovah? I think most of us do, and we're not alone. Even our Lord Jesus had that same circumstance. Even though his half-brothers knew about the miracles he was performing, the Bible says that they were not expressing faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Well, it was so bad, can you imagine, that when Jesus was being put to death, there it is, their favorite phrase, when Jesus was put to death. If you've seen my videos, you know that this is the case. I, I think I say this in almost every video. Anyway, just awful. Let's keep going. It appears that his brothers were not there. Do you remember the account? 
where Jesus was on the torture stake and he looked down at the disciple and asked him, basically, to become responsible for his mother. They weren't there to support him. But what happened just a short while after Jesus had been resurrected? Well, it was amazing because some of those half-brothers were found, along with Jesus' mother, with the disciples fervently praying. Maybe one of your relatives, maybe your mate, one of your children, one of your siblings has now come to serve Jehovah. How wonderful, what a joyful feeling. Really nothing could compare to it. What was it that helped Jesus' brothers to acquire faith? Well, here's the number one thing. Jesus was patient with his relatives. So the number one reason why Jesus' brothers put faith in him was because he was patient with his relatives. I almost laughed out loud with this, friends. Listen, Jesus rose bodily from the dead. He walked out of that tomb. And in a Jewish city, people became Christians as a result of it. His body was not stolen. It was never found. And people are still worshiping him today, period. Jesus did not take offense, even though his relatives were trying to seize him, even though they said he had gone crazy. Have your relatives perhaps said some things like that to you? Jesus did not take offense. He was patient. You may remember that in Acts chapter 15, when the apostles and older men gathered in Jerusalem to consider the matter about circumcision, it seems that James was the one who was presiding at that meeting. We want to be patient with our relatives too. It's true, Jesus described the message of the truth like water that could lead to everlasting life. All right, hold on a minute. Did you hear what he just said? Listen again. True, Jesus described the message of the truth like water that could lead to everlasting life. Friends, look at these verses I'm about to put on the screen here and let me know if Mark Sanderson, who claims to be one of Christ's brothers, is telling you the truth or if he's lying to you. Jesus said in John 7, if any man thirst, let him come to me. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. John 4, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. The water I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Revelation 7, for the lamb shall lead them into living fountains of water. Jesus gives the water. Jesus is the water. The message of the truth or the watchtower lie is not like water that leads to everlasting life, friends. But have you ever tried to drink from a fire hydrant? That's a very difficult thing to do. We don't want our relatives to choke because we're forcing too much information or with too much force or power. Instead, we want our relatives to feel refreshed by the truth. Some years ago, a brother in Mexico from the rurals, dressed in very simple country garb, knocked at the door of a palatial mansion. A man in a silken bathrobe responded and asked what he wanted. The witness said, if a mule should come to your door with two bags of gold, would you accept it? I am that mule that came to your door, and the two bags of gold are these magazines, the Watchtower and Awake. Unbelievable how condescending that this guy is comparing the indoctrinated who peddle these magazines and these lies for free as slaves. He is likening them to mules and likening their publications to gold. You and I both know that these publications always were ending up in the trash, friends. We'd leave them at knotted homes. We would leave them in laundry, um, laundromats. We would leave them on the table and they'd end up in in the trash, and they're supposed to be gold. I believe deep down inside the indoctrination, the indoctrinated know this, which is why Watchtower needs to condition them, to program them, to believe that these publications are as gold, and it and it and it it's working, but not for long, friends. It worked for a long time, but not for long, because Jesus is greater. The truth of Scripture is greater. The Bible says, "Thy word will not return void," friends. The truth of scripture is sharp and it cuts because it's inspired. These Bible-based publications are not inspired. If these magazines are as gold, why are they printing less and less of them? Hmm, makes you wonder. 
All right, now this guy tries to tie in Paul's encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus to the modern day witnesses. Take a look. What was it that moved Paul to have such a change? Jehovah used a startling occasion to stir Paul's heart. World events, personal tragedy, or other changed circumstances, though not initiated by Jehovah, may cause a person prominent in this system of things to reevaluate his or her life and listen to the good news. Such a person may realize that high social status does not offer a solution to life's problems. Yes, I agree with him and what he said, but the answer is not does not lie in becoming a Jehovah's Witness because they preach a false gospel that does not lead to salvation. It leads to enslavement. But I want you to take a look at a video that uh, is next shown. You stay way down. The truth brings you a constant joy. It is, there's nothing like it. It's just complete satisfaction. You just know now you're doing the right thing. And it's just changed our whole life now and our whole attitude. We are just so very content and happy. I just showed a portion of this, but if this is not scripted, then I don't know what is. You and I both know that the witnesses are not content and happy. They are programmed to believe this, but they're filled with fear and anxiety because that is the product of the doctrine that they believe. Deuteronomy, I think it's 18.22, and it talks about a false prophet. And you know what? These guys are prophets because they're God's channel. They're God's mouthpiece. But Deuteronomy 18.22 says that if just one of their predictions does not come true, then they're considered a false prophet. But this is the part that a lot of people miss from this verse. It says, do not fear them because false prophets use fear to enslave their followers. That's the only way they can. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. First, we'll read the uh, first part of that verse. It says, For I am not ashamed of the good news. Now, under inspiration, he then comments on the effectiveness of preaching the good news when he says, It, that is the good news, is in fact God's power for salvation to everyone having faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Friends, this is what the verse says, okay? It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. It's not the truth of the Watchtower Corporation, friends. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ according to Scripture. But Paul says, But we preach Christ crucified, not the Jehovah of Watchtower. And what's underlined says, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Paul preached Christ crucified, not Watchtower doctrine, okay? So listen, uh, Tony Morris is up next, and he proves himself to be the false prophet that he truly is. His goal is to steal your salvation. I'm going to show you this, okay? Listen to what he says. He tells the audience the only way they could acquire faith is when this is done. Take a look. We want to be individuals that Jehovah will use to try to help these non-religious individuals. And the only way that they could acquire faith is when this is done. Now notice carefully and pay attention, Romans chapter 10, 13 through 15. For everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. See, that's so crucial to remember to listen. Sometimes, and sincere witnesses do it, we talk too much. We ask a question, and they have two seconds to answer, next thing we're talking already. Friend, read Romans chapter 10. It's all about Jesus. The only way you can see that they've taken out the name Jesus and inserted the name their God, Jehovah, is if you put it into context. Let me show you a couple of things. It's all about Jesus. Romans 10:9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This false prophet even put emphasis on his deception by telling you to pay attention. And this is the false teaching that he and his friends are telling you, their followers, to spread so that you become false prophets as well. Notice 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. But there were false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. Who is that? 
Jesus. Jesus bought them. They paid the price. Verse 2, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, and through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Aren't they making merchandise of you, friends? You're doing their work. You're peddling their books. You're building their construction projects all for free. You're giving up your lives for this organization that's teaching lies, friends. Look at something else here. Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. But there's hope. Cry out to Jesus. Turn to Christ, friends. He offers salvation as a free gift. All right, so Robert Saranko now gives a tool, uh, gives a talk about how to properly use this new teaching tool that they have, this new book. I, I forget the name of it. Doesn't matter. And they show a video of people all over the world. I think it's maybe India or something like that, peddling, the indoctrinated peddling this false teaching all over the world, making themselves more a child of hell, says scripture as their leaders, okay? I cut it all out, but I want you to show, I want to show you what Saranko says next. Having faith involves coming to know Jehovah as a real person, trusting in him, and forming an unbreakable friendship with him. So, did the God of Watchtower come to earth to become a person? John 15, 14, Jesus is speaking. Ye, meaning all of you, are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not servants or mules, but I have called you friends. Jehovah, the God of Watchtower, has no friends. People need to accept the whole truth about both Jehovah God and Jesus Christ. But still, that is not enough. For at Romans 10.10, 10, the Bible says, with the heart, one exercises faith. A person must not only believe the truth, but must also value it, because only then will he be motivated to act in harmony with the truth. All right, Mr. Saranko. So he wants his, his followers to believe the truth about Jehovah and Jesus. He should then have read the verse prior, because that's the truth. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, who? The Lord Jesus. And how do we know he's talking about the Lord Jesus? And shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saranko read verse 10 in red. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Look at verse 13. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is the Lord there? It's Jesus, friends. It's Jesus. Friends, the Bible clearly teaches a different doctrine unto salvation than this guy and the publications that he's pushing. He's a false teacher, okay? This is why they must study their publications because their God, Jehovah, the God of Watchtower, is not found in the Bible. Otherwise, he could reject convincing evidence of the truthfulness of what he is learning and continue to hold on to false beliefs and wrong practices. We have been given a wonderful new tool with which to build heartfelt faith, the study book, Enjoy Life Forever, an interactive Bible course. It uses key scriptures, clear reasoning, effective questions, beautiful artwork, and stirring videos to help the teacher reach the heart of the student and draw out what he truly believes. These guys are speaking in code. Can you see it? So this new publication will help the teacher draw out what the student believes. Do you hear that? The publication draws out what the student believes not the Bible. Listen to what he's saying. Notice that he says that the artwork also has a part in this, okay? Friends, the, the brain can comprehend even what the eye does not visualize. These pictures have hidden, have a hidden agenda. Let's just keep it. Let's just keep it at that. And when we look at these pictures, the brain can also recognize the story that they are conveying, even when our eyes don't see it. It's beyond comprehension. So he goes on to explain this publication and how wonderful it is and briefly recaps each chapter. Take a look at what he says about, I think, lessons six and seven. Lesson six reveals that Jehovah is the creator of the universe and the source of all life. 
Jesus is the creator. Clearly, clearly scripture. Read John chapter one. Jesus is the creator. Lesson seven explains what Jehovah is like, that he is a real person with many appealing qualities. Jesus died for me. Ron, I think I'm gonna need a little more time to process this. We all do. Let's go ahead and conclude with a prayer and we'll specifically ask Jehovah to strengthen your faith in the ransom and his forgiveness. Later when you pray, you can beg him for the same thing. Thank you. Okay. God's spirit produces faith only in people whose heart favors the truth over lies. Let us use Enjoy Life Forever to teach the truth to those with whom we study the Bible and to help build their faith in Jehovah and Jesus. Sorry, friends, I had to stop the video for a moment if, if it looks a little different. But anyway, this was just too much. I'm going to try to keep this under 30 minutes, but I don't know. I left a lot out. But anyway, friends, turn to Jesus Christ. We have got to get rid of the lies of Watchtower, and we must replace them with the truth of Scripture. This is why I wrote this 30-day devotional. It, every day, it gives you a truth about who you truly are in the eyes of your Creator. Uh, I give the Scripture a little bit of commentary and a place where you can write which lies that you are going to replace. Because, friends, I carried around the doctrine of this organization for 20 years after I got out. It's a doctrine of lies, and we need to fill our minds and our um, our brains with the truth. So anyway, um, thank you so much for watching. Stay tuned for part two. I hope to have up in a couple of days. Thanks for watching, friends, and have a great day.